Thank you for your interest here at North Hills, where we are more than Sunday. If you have any questions or would like to know more about our ministries, you can always visit us online at north-hills.org. Now join us as Pastor Bill delivers his message. Well, good morning. It's good to be here. Good to see all of you. Uh, A lot has been happening at North Hills, a whole lot. A lot of it's been behind the scenes. Uh, Some of it you have not heard a lot about, but you're going to hear more about it today should you choose to stay and hear some more about what's been happening. I bring you greetings from Debbie. I was down in Riverside this week, spending the week with her, and it's always good for us to reconnect. You know, many of you know that uh, her school moved down to uh, the L.A. area, and that's where uh, she's been living since the beginning of the fall semester. She traveled up to see me last semester. I'm traveling down to see her this semester. We're eventually going to be transitioning down there. Many of you have been praying with me what that looks like, how that's going to happen. I don't feel my work here is finished. Debbie agrees with me. Leadership agrees with that. We have some things, some important things we need and want to do. So I'd ask that you would pray with us to make wise decisions regarding the church, regarding the future of the church. If you'd like to have some inside information, following the service, I would invite you to stay for about 10 or 15 minutes just to catch you up on the recent meeting that was held between the leadership team, strategy team, the deacons, and some of the ordained men and the staff that uh, here at North Hills work hard to keep things all working together. So that'll take place immediately following the worship service. Give us a couple of minutes uh, when I say immediately. So stay for that. This morning, the title for the message is when being good isn't good enough. Uh, We all know what it's like to be judged. We all know what it's like for someone to say, well, you just didn't cut it. You didn't make the grade. You didn't live up to the standard. You know, your boss will tell you you've got to work harder or you're fired. Your spouse will tell you you've got to work harder or you're fired. Uh, Your kids will tell you you've got to work harder or you're fired all through life. We feel like we've got to perform, get better. You guys know what it's like, this group down here sitting down front. You're in school. You've got to dress right. You've got to talk right. You've got to walk right. You've got to hold your pencil right you got to wear your hat right everything's got to be just right because if it's not then you're just not good enough boy it feels bad when you don't feel like you're good enough and I get a witness when someone puts you down when someone criticizes you when someone says you just don't cut it don't make the grade you just don't live up to the standards well I believe there's three kinds of people here today Don't hold me fast to this, but I believe, generally speaking, of all the people here or in any other church all over this world, there's three kinds of people in a worship service. There's one group of people that I'll call the uh, legalist, and uh, they really don't know God personally. They know there is a God, and, and their general feeling about God is, well, you know, if I just live good enough, maybe, maybe when I'm before God, he'll let me in. If I just live good enough. Some of you may be just like that. Maybe you're borderline agnostic, or maybe you might call yourself atheist, although you're not sure you're spiritual, but you really don't know about this Jesus and the Bible and all that's written in his book. There's a second group of people. Those I'm not sure what I would call them, but they're uncertain in their relationship with God. They come to church regularly. They believe in Jesus, they believe in the Word, but there's been something about religion that's taught them to be good or else. And so you come to church and you just hope you cut it. You just hope when you get out there on the week that you're not going to upset God and He's not going to knock you over the head with that big spoon or the thunderbolt. You know, that you're the kind of person that, that if you're standing around someone and they come out with a dirty word, you kind of step back a little bit and go, I'm getting away from that thunderbolt that's getting ready to strike. And there's a third kind of people, and I hope many of you are that way. That's, that's how I am. I believe in Jesus. I believe in salvation. I believe what he's done in my life. I have faith in God. I want to love God. I try to love God more. I know I fail in many occasions. I make mistakes, but I know grace, and grace is good. It's from God. And and when I come to church and I leave, I, I don't leave with guilt. I don't leave feeling that I've disappointed God again. I leave knowing that being good is not good enough. So I don't know what kind of person you are today. 
I'd like you to think about that as we move through the message. I'm going to have a leading sentence for each of those three topics and a couple of words that characterize those topics. Then we're going to look at Peter for a few minutes, and then I'm going to ask you, what kind of person are you today? And I'm going to pray that you can understand what this scripture text means. Let's rotate to the next slide from 2 Corinthians 5.21. For our sake, that's everybody. It's everybody in the world. Jesus died for everybody in the world. Jesus was made to be sin. Literally, Jesus took on all of our sin. He who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. So I ask you this question this morning. How righteous do you feel? How righteous do you feel? Would you consider yourself as righteous as me? How about as righteous as your wife or husband, your mom or your dad? How about as righteous as the Apostle Paul? How about being in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, do you believe that you have become the righteousness of God in him? Well, that's a whole lot in one introduction, so let's get to the first point real quick. The first point asks the question, what do I need to do to get God to? You can fill in the blank. Some of you pray, oh God, what do I need to do to get you to make me well? God, what do I need you to do so you'll find me a spouse? God, what do I need you to do so you'll pass the test? God, what do I need you to do so you'll get my mortgage paid this month? And your relationship with God is based on doing. And so the two words that we want to look at are religion and do. Because this first idea about doing is the religious term. Now, many of you would consider yourselves to be religious. I would like to convince you that you don't need to consider yourself to be religious. You need to consider yourself to be righteous in relationship with Jesus. Now, there's a huge difference between the two because religion is based on what you do and what you don't do. Religion says if, then. Religion very clearly says if you live up to this mark, then God will give you this grade. And so all through our faith walk, it's all about, am I good enough? Did I do it? Is he going to please? Is he going to be pleased? Is he going to be pleased? What's he going to say? What if I don't? What if I don't? And, and you have this tension and this worry, am I really good enough to go to heaven when I die? And a lot of time has been evaluating your life by what you do. Every religion that I can think of in the world from the Eastern religions, even to the religions of the American plains before the West settled here, when the Native Americans were living in this area, all the way down in South America, all across the world, every religion and every culture is focused on do this so this will happen. And it's the same with Judaism. Now, when I ask you if you're a Christian, and you say, yes, I'm a Christian, I ask you to believe in the Bible, you say, yes, you believe in the Bible, how do we differentiate in God's word between what God said to the Jews that is for the Jews and to the Jews and still for the Jews today versus those of us who are born again by the blood of Jesus Christ? Now, this is a religious concept that a lot of you don't think about. Did you know that this Bible that you may have you can hold it up or you can look at it or point to it. Most of it begins in the beginning with Genesis. And then when it ends, a new part of the Bible is written. And that begins to tell, to tell the story of Jesus. And it starts with Matthew. But have you ever wondered about how to understand all of the laws and the teachings of the Old Testament under the grace of a life saved by Jesus Christ. Now, we joke and say, you know, if, if I was really living according to the Bible, I wouldn't be able to eat bacon, right? You, you've heard that, can't have ham sandwiches, because the Jews couldn't eat meat from pork. But there are a lot of other rules and regulations in the Old Testament. 
So there's something about we are not Jews, we are Christians, but yet the Old Testament is so important because it leads us to understand who Jesus is, and then once Jesus comes into our life, then the law has led us to Jesus, but then we can release the law so that we can embrace the grace, and then Jesus Christ comes and lives in our life. His Holy Spirit then comes into our heart, and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will write a new law onto the fleshly tablets of our hearts, and then God will be able to see and judge us by our righteousness in our heart. Have you heard that? Do you understand that? So in other words, we don't live by the Old Testament laws, or do we? Now that's the question that you're going to ask, have to ask by yourself. But I want to put up a couple of uh, text from Deuteronomy. Let's put up this first one. In Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 through 2, let me ask yourself, is this your call to faith? Well, God says clearly to the Jews, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands that I give you today, Moses writing to the people of the Jews, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your law. The Lord your God. Now, that, that sounds good. Sounds great. Great. So, so some of the things that will happen if you do these things, well, you'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the field. You'll be blessed in the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, the fruit of your cattle. All these things will increase. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Your spaghetti bowl will overfill. Your refrigerator will never go empty. Your car will never run out of gas. It will never break down on you. All these things will be blessings unto you. Now, I'm kind of taking a little liberty to stretch it a little bit. But the idea is, this clearly says, if you do what God says, everything in your life is going to be good. It's going to be right. And this is the basis upon which the prosperity preachers get their theology. You know what I mean when I say prosperity preachers? Health, wealth, and prosperity. So let's look at the next part of the text then, because this is the other side of that. However... If you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees as I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and will overtake you. So, in other words, if, if we as Christians are living in this Old Testament if-then relationship with God, just like the Old Testament believers lived with God, then when we don't do these things, he will send curses, confusion, frustration, and all that we undertake until we are destroyed and perish on account of evil deeds, because we have forsaken him, pestilence will come. We'll be consumed from the land. It'll take possession of us. We'll have disease, inflammatory things, uh, fiery heat and drought, etc. We don't want to go there. I promise. So, here's what happens. If you believe in religion doing, every one of you are going to fail, because what? Being good isn't good enough. Say that with me. Being good isn't good enough. So if we believe, as every religion in the world except Christianity believes, that what we do will affect how we enter into God's heaven, then nobody here is going to be able to make it. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, the apostle says, no, not one. So religion says do do means you'll never be able to live up to it. And then we step into the New Testament, and now all of a sudden Jesus has come to explain this to us. That's why Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy the law. No, the law is beautiful. It's perfect. It leads us to understand God because the law says you are a sinner because you sin. We are born with that nature, and there's nothing we can do about it. There comes a time in our life when God comes and speaks to us, and we are held accountable then for our sinfulness. I don't know whether it's 8, 9, or 10. I have a feeling it's somewhere around 13, 14, and 15. It's that teenage year of rebellion. I believe Adam and Eve were teenagers in heart. That's where people become rebellious against authority, begin to challenge, and that's when God comes in and says, hey, guys, I want to be your law. I want to be your Lord and Savior. That's why middle school and high school are such important years in the life of individuals. And if they don't get it there, many will never get it, and they'll leave church for many, many years. 
So we move into the New Testament then, and I want to share a story that Jesus tells to a young man who was very wealthy. You know the story. It's found in Mark chapter 10. Jesus is walking down the road, and a rich young guy comes up to him and says, hey, what do I need to do to go to heaven? And he goes on to tell Jesus how good he is. I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that. I've done everything, Jesus. What else do I have to do? That's your typical religious person, and many of you are just like that. Many of you think you're good enough to go to heaven. Now, you may not be as good as, as another person that's more churchy than you, but you've never killed anybody. You've probably never committed adultery. You don't really lie a lot, although you do occasionally. You don't cuss a lot, although a couple of words slip from your mind. You know what I'm talking about, right? So here, this rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, if you want to look at Mark 10, 21, I don't have it up on the screen this morning. But Jesus basically looks at the young man and says, you know, I understand you've done all these things, and that's good. But then he says this powerful statement, and this powerful statement can be said to you right now, this one thing you lack. Think about that for a moment. No matter how good you try to be, no matter how you try to live according to Deuteronomy, the first couple of verses there, you will always lack one thing. That's why Paul's going to say later on to the Galatians that no matter how hard you try, if you break one letter of the law, you might as well have broken all of them. So the Old Testament is important. Religion is important because it shows us we can't be religious. We can't do all the do's. We can't be perfect to get into God's heaven. And once we understand that, then we understand that there must be another way. And that's what turns our mind and our eyes towards Jesus. Now, Pastor James has just taken us through a great sermon series on who we are, my name is, our identity. And this one text that we've talked about in chapter 5, verse 21, already has mentioned that. And this is where I want to really key in this morning, that, that God through Jesus, took all of our sin and all the world, past, present, and future, because we weren't alive when Jesus died, right? So all of our sin in the future was put on Christ in the past, and all of the sin of Adam and Eve forward was put on Jesus Christ on the cross in the future, and on the cross, Jesus Christ, who never sinned, who never disobeyed one law, who had a full filled heart for God God put that sin on him and the Bible says that he made him who knew no sin to become sin why so that we now the we is he talking about just Paul and the disciples or is he talking about us also us right he brings us into that so that we might become what? The, come on, say it. I Say it. It's not hard to say. Righteousness. We are righteous if we are born again and Jesus Christ lives in us. Not righteous because of what I do, but righteous because of what he has done. I have the righteousness of God covering me. And I believe that when God the judge looks down upon me and he sees Bill Steele, he says, Bill, I don't want to see your sin. I don't want to see your ugliness. I'm the judge. I'm the Father, the God Almighty. I want to see righteousness on you because only righteousness can come into my heaven for eternity. And that's how God sees me, as righteous in Christ. Now, the other side of that story is a little more personal. You see, God left us the Holy Spirit, right? Where does the Holy Spirit live? In us. So if we're covered by the cloak of righteousness that the Old Testament talks about, if we're covered by the cloak of righteousness, which is what Jesus Christ has done, if God the Father, the judge, looks at us and sees the cloak of righteousness that Jesus has put on us, and he sees us as Jesus' righteousness, not my righteousness, I have no righteousness. It's like filthy rags. But when I wear the righteousness of Jesus... I know God's looking at that. But the other 
flip side of the coin is that the Holy Spirit living in me knows every dirty thought and deed I ever do or think. And he does you too. So God works on the outside and the inside with us. On the inside, the Spirit's showing us and, and, and convincing us where we sin and saying, stop that, it's not good for you. It's hurting your relationship with your spouse. It's hurting your work. It's hurting your relationship with your kids. You're not paying your bills. You're not uh, being fair and true in all your relationships. Stop that. That's the Holy Spirit working inside of us. But God the Father is going, go Spirit, go Spirit, but man, I got you. I got you. You are my righteousness in Jesus Christ. That's good news, folks. And if we really understand that and believe that and know that, then we move forward in our walk with Christ. If we get stuck there, which many of you are, many of you are stuck not believing you live up to God's standards for salvation. I didn't say standards of goodness. Because remember, being good isn't good enough. That brings us to the second point. Then the question is, what has God done to save me from? And that's the question we need to ask. What has God done to save me from? And that's where the cross comes in. Jesus Christ went to the cross. And that brings us to our key verse here. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him and only in him, we might become the righteousness of God, not my righteousness, not Richard's righteousness, not David's righteousness, not Kelly's righteousness, not James' righteousness, not Bob's righteousness, not Annie's righteousness, but the righteousness of God. That's the righteous robe I wear as a believer in Jesus. Do I still sin? Of course I do. Do I do it on purpose? Yeah, and so do you. <laughs> do I need a license to sin? Nope, I do it very well all by myself. And we all do. So how do we live in that tension? Because if we don't, we're going to be caught up into these two words, and those two words are going to tell us that righteousness has got to be focused on done, but we get stuck on this done because we don't really believe that God could have done something like that for someone like us. God really couldn't do something like that for something like us. And so let me show you this catchphrase here because this kind of sums it up. The law condemns the best of us. Jesus saves the worst of us. The law condemns the best of it, us. No matter how good we try to be, we're never going to be good enough. But Jesus Christ saves the worst of us. That's powerful, folks. That's powerful. And it's hard to believe. Once we begin to understand this and get our minds wrapped around that, then the question, the true question, the good true question, it's not what can I do to get God to or what do I have to do to get God to do this? The real solid question is this. How can we believe to help us to belong? And the two catchwords then with this are relationship and belonging. And that's what the sermon series was, was about. And I think we is going to be talking about the body, and we are the body. And together, we, 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 we are together, we belong. But to belong, we first have to believe. Now, I'm not saying you have to believe everything exactly as it's been taught to you, or everything that is even hard to understand. I'm not saying you have to understand every intricate part of God's truth, but you need to understand the very basic truth of God's Word, and that is taking the Old Testament and the New Testament and understanding this. God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin. That's the cross. That's bringing the Old Testament that says you can never live perfect to the law. Jesus fulfilled the law, and he was the perfect one. And then from the New Testament, we understand the term salvation or propitiation that comes from crucifixion. I'm going to try to explain that word in a moment. But we understand that this experience that Paul talks about in Galatians has got to be our experience. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Therefore, this life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, loves me, loved me, loves me, past tense, future tense, and gave himself for me. Jesus died on the cross for Bill Steele. Yeah, you too, but I know he died for me. And I've got to understand that, believe that, get my mind wrapped around it, because until I do, I'll be caught up in this game of good works, and I will always lose. And there's nothing worse than always losing all the time. We bought a new ping pong table at the house that uh, we bought down in Riverside, and uh, we got it out, and so we wanted to play, and of course, Debbie beat me the first three games straight, beat me bad. Did I want to play anymore? No, I put my paddle away, and I said, I'm through. She couldn't understand. She wanted to keep playing. Well, yeah, as long as you're winning, you want to keep playing. But the loser doesn't feel very good. We need to understand that God does not want us to be guilted into relationship with him, and that is where we bring in Peter. Peter wanted to belong. Peter so wanted to belong. You can just imagine this rough, tough fisherman, boater. He was out there, sailor, cursing, just rough and tough. You can imagine, you've heard the stories. And uh, here he meets Jesus, and he thinks to himself, I want to belong to Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Peter wanted to belong. He wanted to belong so bad that he went after Jesus. He did everything that he could. He even used his uh, quick-to-respond attitude in a very bad, negative way, and Jesus had to rebuke him on several times. You remember that. One time they were out on the water, and the boat was being tossed on the sea, and all of a sudden they look up and they see Jesus come walking towards them, and so Peter says, hey, Jesus, I'd like to get out there and walk to you. Jesus says, well, get out, Peter. Come on. We know the story. It's a great story, isn't it? Peter got out of the boat, and he began to walk, and his eyes were fixed on Jesus, just like the author of Hebrews says in chapter 11, that we should fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For who went before us endured the cross, endured the shame of the cross, and then afterwards sat down where he's sitting today, giving intercession for you and me. So Peter's got his eyes fixed on Jesus. He's walking out on the water. The waves are coming up. The wind's blowing. And what happened? Jesus looked (laughs) away. He looked away from Jesus, and immediately, you you could probably imagine the water rising up from his ankles towards his knees to his hips, and all of a sudden, he calls out, Oh, Jesus, save me. You see, Peter got his own fle- he got into his own flesh. He began thinking he could handle this. He knew what was going on. Hey, I can get out there. I can walk on Jesus. As long as he kept his eyes fixed on Jesus, things were good. But as soon as he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to fall in the water. Well, we know the next story about Peter. Peter ended up denying Jesus. Jesus told him, Peter, just like Peter, Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem. Something bad's going to happen. They're going to lock me up. Oh, Peter says, no, never, Jesus. I'll never let that happen to you, right? He rebukes Jesus. Now, you think you've messed up a couple of times, right? You rebuke Jesus regularly. Jesus says, you're going to have a great, happy day. Oh, no, Jesus, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. Come, come back and give me a more realistic answer. Peter rebukes Jesus, right? You get that? I mean, not good. Not good to rebuke God. So Peter does this, and then Jesus says, okay, Peter, here's what's going to happen. You know, you're going to be out. The the, the rooster is going to crow, you know, three times. After the third time, you're going to deny me. Turns out that's exactly what happened. Peter was out around the fire looking through the gate where Jesus was being questioned and beat, and he denies him three times. See, Peter, early on, was caught in the religion of the Jew. So understand what I talked about at the beginning. The Jew says, do this, don't do that. If you do this, then this will happen. If you don't do this, then that will happen. And Peter was caught up in that. He was a Jewish man. It was natural for him to follow the Jewish religion. He was doing what he knew to do. But Jesus came to teach Peter something different, right? Right? Peter was going to learn something different that the Jewish religion could not teach him. And so then we see that Peter and Jesus are having a conversation. There's another charcoal fire. 
Jesus has been to the cross, he's been resurrected, and he's on the beach. Peter sees him jump in the water. You've heard the story, many of you have. Swims to the beach and comes up to Jesus. And then Jesus pulls Peter aside. And if you've got this in John chapter 21, it's a great message. You've heard it many, many times. I hope to share something with you. Maybe you've not heard quite the same way. But understand, here's Jesus, here's Peter. <clears throat> They're having a conversation <clears throat> by themselves. They're walking along the beach. And Jesus comes out and he says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And the word he uses for love is agape. You've heard that word, right? It's this super great word for love, which means sacrificing anything and everything. You know, Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 describes that kind of love. And so Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. So he uses the word phileo for love. So it's kind of like saying love versus like. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Jesus, I like you. Well, that's a letdown. I mean, if you tell your spouse, I love you, and they come back on Valentine's and say, yeah, I like you. Okay, you get the meaning. So Jesus comes back another time, a second time. Peter, do you agape me? Yes, Jesus, I phileo you. I like you. Tend my sheep. But this is powerful. Heard this just recently. Write this down. Sketch it in your mind. The third time then, have you ever wondered why Jesus didn't ask, Peter, do you phileo me? Do you like me? And then Peter responds, yes, Jesus, you know. I like you. It's because Peter had not come to a place in his heart where he understood that kind of love that Jesus had for him. Peter couldn't come up with that kind of love. He knew he fell short. He knew there was something missing. Now let's not ask the question, well, was Peter born again? Was he a Christian at this time? It's a good question to ask because really, until the Holy Spirit comes and acts, the church is born, and, and all the fullness of the church takes place, it's kind of understand the moment of salvation for those people who walked with Jesus. So let's not get wrapped up in that. But let's just answer the question by saying Peter didn't understand everything it meant to love God, and I don't think that some of you do either. I know I don't fully, but this is where I spend most of my time trying to understand how to love God. And most of my life trying to figure out how to love God has always been focused on what I need to do. Until I really began to look and try to understand love better. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, I introduced these thoughts more this morning and last night, so I don't have them on the slide. 1 John chapter 4, 10, the beloved John, who was just the exact opposite of Peter. If you ever wanted to see two different Peter, people, look at Peter and look at the apostle John. John says, this is love, not that we have loved God. That's not love. Loving God is not us loving God. That's not the definition of agape love. Agape love is defined that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or sacrifice for our sins, 1 John 4.10. That's love. Love is belonging to God because God calls us. God draws us. He reaches out and he picks us up. He gives us a robe of righteousness. He cleanses us of all sin. He plants his Holy Spirit in our heart to lead us and guide us through life. And then he teaches us that to belong to God means to understand how much God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave. So I no longer really focus on how I have to love God. My focus is how, how can I see God's love for me and know that if this great God loves me this much, how can I look poorly upon myself? If I know that God loves you that much, how can I look poorly upon you or others? I want to read another scripture to you. Same book, 1 John, but flip back to chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, the first three verses because this is where I want to conclude. By concluding, I mean asking you 
to ask yourself what kind of relationship you have. Do you belong to God? And if you say, yes, you belong to God, do you belong to God because you love and connect yourself with him? Or first, you understand that he loves and connects you to him. In other words, are you holding on to God or is God holding on to you? I remember one time I had my son, four years old, we were walking along the jetties. You know, you're usually holding your hand, son, and you're just holding the fingers and, you know, kind of walking and walking, and it's kind of nice. But as soon as we got up on the jetties, I re gripped my son's hand, and I no longer held his fingers, I held his wrist. Because I knew if he slipped, I had to be holding his wrist to make sure he was safe. Now, my son thought that he was holding on to me, but he wasn't. I was holding on to him. And folks, that's where I am, and I love it. it. Gives me such freedom. No guilt in my life at all. Yeah, I'm sad when I sin. I'm sad and hurt when I do things. I confess and I grieve those things to God because I know it hurts other people. But Paul says in Romans chapter 8 very clearly, there is no condemnation for Bill Steele because he's in Jesus Christ. Can I get a little amen from that? There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. You cannot be found guilty again because you already were found guilty once. But Jesus Christ saved you from that and gave you his righteousness. And so here's what John says in chapter 3 then. 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love then the Father has given us. So he gives us that kind of love so we can reciprocate. That we should be called children of God. And so we are. Now that's God establishing who we are. We are righteous in him. <clears throat> and this is the reason why the world does not know us. It's because the world does not know Jesus Beloved, we are God's children now, and what, will, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we will know it when it appears, talking about the coming of Jesus in his full glory. We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Peter fixed his eyes on Jesus. As soon as he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to fall. In your relationship with God today, did you start today by fixing your eyes on Jesus? When you got up this morning, did you fix your eyes on Jesus? Making coffee, did you fix your eyes on Jesus? Driving down the road. I hope you were looking at the road, but spiritually speaking, did you fix your eyes on Jesus? Coming into church, were you thinking about Jesus or sports? Were you thinking about Jesus or family? Were you talking about, thinking about Jesus or the fight you just had with your spouse coming into the building? Were you fixing your eyes on Jesus? You're going to leave here all day today. You're going to have opportunities to fix your eyes upon Jesus and to recognize as he is, so are you. You have his righteousness. And we don't have to be people of guilt, but people of faith. How would you describe your relationship with God? That's completely up to you. If you're uncertain that God exists, if you're stealing, still dealing with this, well, you know, maybe he is, I'll try to be good, but, you know, I'll do the best I can, and who knows, if there is a God, maybe he'll let me in. If not, I guess there's no God, we'll all just die when we die. That may be who you are today. I'd like you to know there's a better way. You can have confidence and assurance in Jesus Christ today if you feel him calling you. If you feel that tug on your heart right now, if you feel that conviction, if you feel the sin, if you feel the disappointment and the despair and the sin in your life and God's saying to you, you don't have to carry that with you out of here. You can get rid of that guilt. You can get rid of that sin. You can get rid of that load. There's a second group of people, and I said that already. You come in and you struggle with this do and don't, be good, you're not good. Like Paul, I'm constantly, you know, I don't do what I want to do. I can't do what I want to do. How can I get this monkey off my back? How can I quit some of these things and be the person that God's called me to be? But you're counting on yourself, on how you think you belong to God. And God wants you to understand the third way, and that is that you belong to him through Jesus. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. I want you just to think and reflect on this question. Who are you? Door number one, door number two, or door number three. 
If Jesus Christ were to come today and say, why would I let you into my heaven? What would your response be? It shouldn't be, well, I've been baptized. Well, Lord, my dad was a deacon in the Baptist church. Or my mom sang in the choir. Or I think I'm good enough. I've never killed anybody, God. I've lied a couple of times, but I've never perjured myself in court. God, I know I've done a couple of things here and there, but generally speaking, I'm a pretty good person. Would you want to count on that to go into heaven? Or maybe you're the kind of person that says, I'm a member of North Hills Church. I was baptized, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, but I'm really not sure if I'm good enough to go to heaven. I'd like to be God. God's going to say, stop counting on yourself and on your own righteousness and trust me and let my righteousness be sufficient for your grace, the grace of God that is beyond all comprehension. For by grace we've been saved through faith. Neither grace nor faith come from us, but they're all a gift of God, so nobody can be boasting. But we all have been appointed for good works. And that's the second part of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We've all been appointed to good works. And the good works are those things that please God, yes, but our salvation doesn't depend on it pleases others and others can see Jesus in us and that's what makes it important so I'd like to ask you today if you're not sure where you are with Jesus whether you're uncertain that God exists where you've been fighting the good and bad and the ugly or whether or not you know he's your righteousness find ways to fix your eyes on him when you get up in the morning when you walk through the day when you lay down at night I'm not talking about a number of verses you've got to recite or a number of minutes that you have to pray or a position in which you have to pray. I'm not talking about how many people you've got to testify to before your day is finished. I'm talking about walking with Jesus, letting him hold on to you. 